We're excited to be diving in um, with Block Games today, and uh, it is, um, yeah, an exciting time to be talking about GameFi and all the things uh, sort of related to it. So, yeah, we'll be doing an AMA uh, at the end of this space um, with uh, Block Games, so get your questions ready. In the first, kind of one-third, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about markets, latest movements, uh, things that are happening in the space, uh, interesting things that perhaps you know, traditional media is not paying attention to. In, attention to. Uh, then we'll go into the matter at hand, which is going to be talking about GameFi and uh, just crypto gaming. Web3 gaming, we have so many words for it. I, I don't even really know what to call it at this point. But basically games uh, combined with crypto. So uh, yeah, maybe before, while we dive in, I, I want to go to Matthew first. Matthew, uh, welcome to the space. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts about what is just happening uh, in the... Well, okay, let's give, give a few just overviews. So right, a BTC kind of at 70K. Uh, it's kind of moved up and down. N not much movement. Um, in terms of volatility, uh, but of course, you know, everyone loves to see price action and see what happens. So, so no news there, but it is at about 70, uh, 70 K right now. We of course have the Bitcoin happening happening in about, uh, nine days or so, uh, depends on, I mean, give or take, uh, and it really will, uh, of course that means the block reward goes in half and lots of things will happen, um, most likely, uh, and, uh, not to mention that Bitcoin ruins on, on the moment of the happening. Uh, will be uh, sort of you know available for all the DGENs out there who want to build meme coins on on Bitcoin. Uh, but Matthew, I'll, I'll go to you first. What's happening in the markets, and what are things that uh, yeah, just broader markets before we get dive into GameFi specifically? Hey, thanks for having me up here. Um, I hope you can all hear me. I was literally just about to like repost the room and do all of that kind of stuff. So apologies for like fumbling around on uh, getting up here. Oh, um, yes. I think um, markets are, are very curious at the moment because the CPI data should have taken a bit more wind out of the sails, maybe. Um, and I think we are actually, no one knows what this halvening is going to do. And this is one of the funny things because uh, VCs were predicting a little while back that we would have a much steeper fall off at this point. People were telling me GDC would be the peak. And that's the game developer conference about three weeks ago or so. Um, and then it would... Yeah, that's right. I was there. Were you there, Matthew? Yeah, Were you yeah I was there. Oh, okay, I was speaking about AI. I was speaking on an AI uh, panel there. So, oh, cool. Yeah, I, I was speaking that. on a WeMix panel. Um, oh, nice. So, okay, there we go. <laughs> yeah, so it was good fun. Except yeah, uh, WeMix took me out for Soju, and it was got very nasty. Um, but yeah, all good. <laughs> uh, apologies. Oh, man, I know, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. I've done a few deals over Soju, so that's kind of the way you, you, you have to do deals in Korea, at the very least. But yeah, it, back it to you, Matthew. Fun. It was good fun. But yeah, so... Um, I, that was that was basically the prediction that we would we would actually be looking at the at the bull run sort of later in the year. So I think people have been actually pleasantly surprised by the amount of coin launches that are happening, and um, the amount of meme coins on Sol is basically killing Sol, which is hilarious. And also, it's it's funny because Sol used to be a bit of a joke for this, uh, but now it's even more bullish on Sol that so many people actually want to use it. So the gambling season is definitely not over, even though the economy is potentially overheating um are we preparing ourselves for a bigger crash later or will the halvening actually take some sort of effect there are so many new things with uh, meme coins apparently coming to bitcoin there are 2.1 quadrillion satoshis i don't know how many of those are liquid or able to be written on but apparently bad drawings on satoshis is going to be a matter for at least two weeks so let's see how that goes yeah, so you brought up so many interesting things. I'll hone in on some of the first things you said, and I do want to get into runes as well, which is just so interesting. But uh, but Matthew, the question I'd ask is CPI numbers. You're talking about that. What about the CPI number? Like, why do you think the markets in crypto have reacted the way they have, right? I mean, in, in many ways, we're kind of finally seeing the decoupling, right, of high beta tech stocks like Tesla and something like Bitcoin, which a lot of people said, oh, you know, just, you know, basically crypto is just has a similar beta to and similar correlations to, um, you know, to, to high beta equities, which I never agreed with necessarily. I mean, there were there were times for sure where that was true, but there are also times where it's not and it's increasingly not. So, yeah, Matthew, back to you about CPI numbers and crypto number and, and the crypto prices. Well, I think um, there was a little bit more security given to Bitcoin with the ETF. Um, and while we do still largely track the tech indexes, I think it's slowly people are starting to realize actually, hey, there's still money being made. Um, there's still money to make in crypto. There are still narratives where we can make serious amounts of, um, of cash in a very short time. And so 
risk is still on. And I think this is, this is largely because at, at the moment, there doesn't seem to be a good place to put your money. Um, so I think it's really interesting that even though the CPI data should be knocking the wind out of it, people are also expecting that maybe there's a change of policy with the upcoming election year, that the halvening could, could actually have some sort of big effect. So I think people are holding their breath, hedging their bets. I'm, I'm guessing, this is just a wild guess, that we will crab, maybe violently up and down for a bit, but people really don't know where this is going to settle. And um, no one really wants to take the lead from the general markets because it isn't that bad. Inflation numbers going up a little bit. Um, we haven't seen a huge reaction from that. If interest rates took a massive spike, then I think we would see um, uh, the, the large whales and the sort of industry money flow out again. Yeah, definitely. And another thing I want to hit, hit, on, hit on is Solana, the meme coins on Solana, and now the coming meme coins on Runes. Uh, so for those who don't know, uh, Matthew kind of alluded to this, but in the Bitcoin happening there uh, coming in about nine days, uh, there's going to be the ability for, um, you know, basically anyone to etch uh, up to at the, at the beginning 13 character 13 character tokens so you can't get like three character tickers just yet on, on bitcoin with runes but you know in the beginning you get to 13 and then there'll be a gradual process where you can get more but uh yeah meme coins are coming to bitcoin and uh, obviously you have meme coins already brc20s uh things like ordi which have a 1.5 billion dollar market cap uh but uh casey rod the you know the the founder of the ordinals protocol um uh the creator really of the Ord or of ordinal theory on bitcoin and the ordinals protocol is uh, going to be, uh, you know, basically shepherding this as opposed to BRC20, which was kind of created separately. So Matthew, I guess Solana, let's talk about that, right? So Solana's kind of had a bit of a rough time last uh, week or so just because of the congestion on the network not being able to. So we're seeing kind of real differences between different L1s. So maybe talk a little about Solana, what's happening there and some of the issues with Solana itself uh, and Bitcoin, which has far fewer transactions per second. I mean, what are we going to be in a world where you have, you know, meme coins, you know, kind of trying to be on the mother of all L1s. So I'll give it to you, Matthew, and then I go to, you know, Ryan and some of the others. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to remind everyone that in 2021, people were, were minting NFTs. And like, um, I see some lovely examples around here, NFTs, and they were paying so much gas fees for this. People are more used to paying money to get rid of inconvenience than they are to things falling over. Solana is more used to fall, falling over than charging people. And I think Solana has actually become horrifically popular. They've been doing hacker houses. They've been doing all sorts of stuff. The meme coins on Sol basically just killed the meme coins on F narrative because it is cheap to make them. It's cheap to do. It's cheap to pump. The money comes in. The money flows out. Um, it's like the thing about Web3 is the economy in Web3 happens at about a thousand times the rate of the general economy. So... If you're in the Web3 bubble, you detach from reality pretty quickly. And Solana has definitely um, been a victim of its own success here. And so I think there's some more upgrades coming soon, which will hopefully increase the throughput. Um, and in general, I think the meme coins on ETH are kind of dead, really, because there isn't really a community behind them. It is just a pump and dump. Um, and we're, we're looking to see if a new chain will, will get this same sort of love. But at the moment, it's, um, it's not looking great for runes um actually being able to have that kind of crazy propagation i think there will be people in there early not financial advice they're earlier than we um we're already pre-signed and basically the people who get free stuff from rooms are the people who are going to make out like um kings if you have to buy interesting in, you're screwed uh, very interesting. I, I'd be curious to get Tokir, and by the way, anyone else who wants to jump in, feel free to raise your hand. Um, we, we'd be happy to go to you, but may Tokir, uh, yeah, or, or, or Roger or some others, we'd be happy to hear about your thoughts about what's happening. And actually, I'll, I'll tee up with something else. I, I was just checking the mempool this morning. I just remembered it's been a busy day. But man, what is happening with the fees on Bitcoin? Is anyone trying to do a Bitcoin transaction today? It's like medium priority, 120 stats per V-byte. I mean, oh my goodness, right? I mean, I remember a day when it was one to two stats of V-byte. Right. So there's two orders of magnitude more. And then, of course, ordinals came in and went to like 50, 60 sats of e-byte and then went back down. But we are at 120 sats of e-byte. We have currently, if you look at the mempool, about 170,000 transactions that are unconfirmed. I mean, man, what I've, like, I don't see any price movement in Bitcoin that warrants this. So if anyone has any insights, feel free to jump in on that um, as to what's making the price of the, the, the just the price confirmed Bitcoin transaction so high. Um, but yeah, Tokyo or others, uh, feel free to jump in with your thoughts on the markets. I think that's always going to be uh, like an, an issue with 
Bitcoin in general. But I think uh, last time also I was speaking about it. Maybe I'll speak more about it right now. There is um, like you know, often people try and use the network directly to transact on Bitcoin. So obviously, you'll always see that kind of a struggle, right? So um, probably like you know, a lot of uh, L twos coming in with this specific same narrative that was happening like a couple of months before. But um, there was, I mean, like uh, there, there were a couple of guys I, I met last, I think, like a couple of months before. They were building this uh, blockchain on Bitcoin, and I was like, okay, I just uh, like you know, just another project. Uh, but instead of like you know, using uh, what most of the developers are doing is like they're they're trying to build through the Lightning networks. But the issue with that is like that's never going to be scalable, and it's never going to like you know that's never going to be basically cost efficient so uh, i mean like i know that a lot of people haven't tried this uh, software yet that is a technology called soft notes uh, which a uh, blockchain which is like um, a layer on bitcoin uh, what they do in the soft notes is like instead of like you know these particular transactions that they're trying to uh, do on the bitcoin uh, you can just simply like you know exchange the uh, wallet code so that those particular wallet addresses or these passcodes are called soft notes um they recently achieved uh, 3.6 million transactions per second which is i think way which is actually the highest and the fastest in the world but also at a, i mean like I, I mean like i don't even know how many sats to put on it right so it's like very small like fractional amount so i think yeah the, the, i mean like as as people are going to understand that part that's that's i i think like technology is going to shift towards that or maybe something better uh, on the other side, someone earlier mentioned uh, with regards to the market, right? So going down. So, but to be honest, like from being from where the where it was, like about seventy thousand or sixty nine thousand, I was expecting like, oh shit, like because CPI missed by 0.4 percent. That's huge. Um, apparently, it did nothing. So yeah, I nothing, mean, nothing at all. It did literally nothing. So it's just like all sort. I I think that the market makers and the altcoins are bit skeptical they want to know like uh, maybe wait till the weekend and then then definitely we are just going to see all coins moving forward as well hmm, interesting um yeah i mean these are some entry market updates happy to hear more thank you for opponing matthew took here uh yeah let's go to the um kind of matter at hand which is kind of crypto gaming but yeah DeFi zoo you got stuff you want to add to that i mean yeah feel free to jump oh, in yeah i just had a uh, quick thought um kind of like a speculative thought um so i know you were mentioning you know, the raising, uh, you know, sats per V byte on Bitcoin and kind of how that's trending upwards and kind of going insane lately. I'm just kind of thinking, um, you know, if that is the trend and it is here to stay, um, I, I kind of feel like that would cause, um, you know, you know, the miners to be getting more profitable if, you know, there's more fees being sent to the network. Um, and you know, one well, except the I, block. I mean, in, in nine days, the block reward's gonna gonna go down by half. Yeah, right? so. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. But just in general, just like kind of speaking in general terms, the more hash rate that's on the Bitcoin network, you know, sometimes it's a lagging indicator. But um, you know, the more hash rate there is, you know, the more you know bullish the charts usually get. But like I said, sometimes it's a lagging indicator. Um, so, you know, definitely with the having and then also the fee increases like going with each other, maybe maybe we will get less of a drop off of hashing power, um, you know, from the having if, you know, smaller, you know, mining operations become unprofitable or something like that. I don't know if that's actually not going to solve this. Yeah. But just uh, yeah. Yeah, just a thought mm -hmm. there on uh, you know yeah. the increasing trend and uh, you know the hash rate and things like that. You know maybe it will um, yeah. You know, generally, for the network. generally speaking, having more miners I think is is a good thing for the network because it helps to secure the network. Uh, I'm talking about the Bitcoin network specifically, um, but it also helps to decentralize more, right? So generally speaking, those are good things. Uh, I guess my comment was more. I mean, you know, I, I look at kind of the mempool uh, every day, and I just noticed that today it just jumped to over 100 i mean it does this sometimes so i'm just curious if there's something going on right right now you know i'm looking at the latest block i mean i'm literally looking at real time uh there's people who are trying to spend 633 stats of vbyte a thousand stats i mean this is a very small small portion of the block but yeah a thousand stats for vbyte uh but on average about 116 110 or so so curious if anybody knew directly but yeah DeFi, you would definitely agree 
generally speaking, that's good for, um, you know, it's good good to secure the network and, and increase decentralization. Um, yeah, let's go to uh, the matter at hand, GameFi. You know, what is happening with GameFi? Let's talk about it. Uh, we kind of did a little preview with Matthew, uh, who was at GDC. So was I. I was noticing there was a lot more Web3 presence at GDC, which is the Game Developer Conference in San Francisco, one of the biggest gaming conferences in the entire world. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. VR, Virtual Reality 8 GDC, 8 GDC, and in 2000, I don't know, 15, 14, 15, maybe 16. And then, you know, AI has been kind of a big deal. I would, I would not say Web3 8 GDC at all. I think AI 8 GDC this year, but Web3 was definitely a big presence uh, for sure. So Roger, uh, you know, Ryan, you know, Ben Ost, uh, I want to go to you all uh, to maybe just opine uh, about what the state of Web3 gaming uh, is, crypto gaming. <laughs> yeah. Um, how's everyone doing? Always a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I, was, I had the pleasure of being at GDC. Um, got to experience the event from both sides, right? From a you know content creator gaming standpoint on Web three, but also from a business standpoint and understanding where a lot of these chains and what their futures are for what's coming up and all this stuff. So yeah, we're working out a lot on this stuff. And you know what I think right now the future looks like for us is you know gamify socialify all these things are blending together and games are trying to figure out how to bring all of it all at once so you know we're really trying you know to bridge the gap of you know onboarding users and giving them that experience that makes them you know continue to play these games and you know bring them and onboard them and i think gdc was a big you know eye-opening experience to see like how far web3 has come and where and how far we are ahead of not necessarily like far ahead of web2 but when it comes to community, how much more Web3 is building from a community standpoint than, you know, what Web2 currently is doing. But also GDC is a more business-sided event, so it's not fair to kind of judge it from that standpoint. So what I will say is, you know, Web3 has a very bright future. A lot of people took notice. Um, you know, I didn't really see VR too much on the VR side. Um, I think well, I think Apple, the Vision Pro, took a little a lot of that, you know, shine the last few months, and I don't think it was really highlighted of what VR is going to be doing in gaming, but I do know VR is pushing heavily on competitive, on different types of comp competitive initiatives as well, um, and we'll continue to see those things thrive. Yeah, definitely, and also, there's just aren't games on Apple Vision Pro. Um, I've been in the industry for over a decade, the VR industry, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's a great device. I got it right there within almost arm's reach, but doesn't play doesn't play games. Uh, it can play a few games. I, you know, there's some that adapted and more and more adapting, but it's just not quite uh, there yet. Uh, Ryan, yeah, we'll go to you. What's uh, what's up? I'd say all in since 2022, we've been saying 2023 is going to be the, the year of Web3 Gaming. 2024 is going to be the year of Web3 Gaming. And I, I really think we could say it comfortably. 2025 is likely going to be the year of Web3 Gaming. We're at a point where these products are good enough that they may be able to capture the attention of traditional Web2 gamers. And we look at games like Neon Heroes, which was trending in the Epic Game Store, capturing the hearts of traditional gamers, Web2 and Web3 alike. All it will take is one good catalyst event, one good white swan event that will bring the masses of gamers to Web3. And it's likely going to be a product of a title that we are all currently familiar with. One of these guys is going to make it, and I'm very much here for it. You know, I I I, agree, I both agree with you because like I, I've been calling you know my 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 battle cry is just come on come on folks like build a good game right. But if I were to step back and say look, it's just kind of a process, right? I mean, process in this and this is coming from somebody who's been a lifelong gamer, right? All the way from the Nintendo Famicom NES days all the way to to now. Um, you know, it's like Crypto Kitties taught us many years ago. I mean, 2017, right? Basically, like that's the kind of the Stone Age in crypto gaming. But it did teach us, oh what? There's this thing called ERC721. And it has these things that allow us to play like a quote game, right? So it's kind of like step one, and then and then later on, Axie Infinity, Sky Mavis, uh, team out of Vietnam, taught us what you know um, Axie Infinity was and what that was like. And honestly, I mean, I I, I don't want to fade Axie as a team. I think they did incredible things, just like the Dapper Labs team did incredible things with CryptoKitties. But it, you know, it just wasn't it. But it was a step. It taught us, hey, there are people who are willing to quit their jobs in Southeast Asia to like play games all day, and it uh, SLP Smooth Love Potion obviously took off. So. It's like, what is the next phase, right? Like, like to me, it's all going to get there in some degree to some in some way. But like, what is the next phase, right? What's the next step? What's the next Crypto Kitties? What's the next Axie? What's the next? And what are the things that are needed? I mean, I keep saying a game that I mean, my 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 thing is games that I want to play. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of interesting. Um, 
Yeah, Ben Ost, we'll go to you. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Let me know. And oh, I, I don't know if Ryan, you wanted to respond to that directly. Feel free. Yeah, I, I always like to give the mic in case somebody won't respond directly. But Ryan, we'll go to you and then we'll go to Ben Ost after. Oh, I'll keep it short and sweet. I you know, said, what's yeah. the thing that's missing? And it's, it's aligning the core expectations of gamers. It's them showing up and having verbiage presented to them and in user interfaces that they're familiar with. And it's, it's a two-part approach, the evolution of gamers, while at the same time removing the friction of Web3. As we all recall, with the release of cell phones and email, people thought it was really difficult. And they said that they would never adopt this. And there will be a middle ground where gamers are more familiar with Web3 tech, and Web3 game providers have reduced a lot of the friction that may exist now, and there will be a perfect harmony that we'll, we'll come to. Then ask, I'll uh, hand it off to you, brother. Hey guys, Jim, uh, and yes, pronunciation is correct. I'm just gonna like also feed, feed in here uh, as uh, while working with a lot of mobile game publishers out here, um, we're seeing that a lot of them are searching, uh, have been searching for the model for the last um, year after the Axie, and CryptoKitties, but actually more after the Axie because Axie model was not sustainable. So every single every, every entire industry was searching for uh, the model that would be sustainable, and actually we are still searching for that model. But it's getting more and more clear that that model involves ownership angles and involves ownership distribution to all of the non-payers in the community, and this is becoming more and more stronger concept that a lot of publishers are becoming comfortable with putting budgets into R&D and throwing up teams and uh, starting uh, iterating uh, on the game design and trying to perfect that model. And I think uh, it takes just one hit to make sure that that new model uh, becomes the next uh, the, the next taxi uh, that allows us to uh, elevate the entire web free gaming industry. Uh, but uh, confidently, we are seeing that a lot of traditional mobile game publishers are feeling more comfortable about uh, 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 risking uh, their budgets and also uh, risking uh, their team resources on trying to innovate on the model. While the model is not yet clear, uh, but I'm sure that this year we should start seeing seeing breakthrough uh, uh, from, from all of those publishers that are investing time. So I guess question, a uh, two-part question to that, that both related is what made Axie Infinity not sustainable, right? Um, so number one, but number two, tying to things like, well, how are the Fortnite economics sustainable, right? You have a free game. Everyone can just play for free, but obviously it's one of the most profitable games in the, in the world because of its cosmetics. You can't pay, pay to win or anything. Um, you don't pay to, pay to earn either, uh, play to earn either. You just play the game, right? <laughs> so, Benasa, over to you. What, uh, what made Axie unsustainable and what do you think are some solutions to that problem? So I, I, I can share uh, a lens from what we're seeing in a mobile gaming industry and uh, ourselves as dev in mobile, game, uh, in, in mobile games, we know that free-to-play uh, mobile games attract 90% uh, of free-to-play players who don't contribute any value whatsoever to your game and you're dependent on running your game and running heavily advertising of your game uh, from the 10 percent ten percent of the users who spend at least uh, some sort of amount of money uh, within your game. Um, so the entire model is ensuring that uh, you have sort you have uh, things coming in uh, uh, of whatever you know, like uh, you, you're you're selling. I think with the vaccine, uh, those things were not clear. Game was simply uh, having simply had more resources and was distributing so much more rewards uh, in the form of the token uh, that didn't have things back in the game uh, that didn't allow for this continuous uh, um, economy to work in uh, and allow for the game to monetize because the game simply needs to monetize uh, in order to survive and in order to uh, be stable um, itself uh, as a game and as a company uh, and support insane amounts of money going into user acquisition because in mobile gaming you're very much dependent on every single dollar that you're spending across uh, across all of the uh, channels so i think um coming back you know to the first line of the uh, first line of the question um sustainable model is the one that allows the game developer take uh, a fee on whatever the economy generates um, and mm -hmm. you need to have interest uh, from the community who are receiving some sort of resource that is tradable so that the community would be interested in sinking that resource back into into the game and that the game dev would be able to take a portion of whatever the community is sinking. But there is a very interesting, um, another model that is 
right now uh, being discussed a lot uh, um, among uh, mobile game devs where you're not making every single game a collectible in your game. So you're making a very small portion of stuff collectibles in your game. And what that does is that it elevates the entire user base and how that user base engages. So uh, I've heard uh, from somebody in the space uh, saying about the social five plus game five merge and that social five um, is coming more into the gaming experiences. And actually that that's what allows the game uh, to uh, grow itself. And what we are seeing also right now across a lot of web gaming projects that we are using the resources or the collectibles that we make on chain uh, to uh, grow the entire game and also to grow the user base. Um, so we're spending less yeah. dollars on marketing, but we are trying to use the same rewards back in. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's, that, that's definitely a very interesting model out there. Yeah, yeah. And, and the reason I bring up, I, I think it's really interesting, and we'll dive into that in the AMA, which I'm excited to get to at the last 15 minutes, but this is really interesting insights. I guess the thing I would I, I would ask or ask, ask you, but also the audience uh, or the rest of the speakers is just, the reason I bring up Fortnite is Fortnite literally, in theory, should have no monetization, right? Um, but they're monetizing better than almost anybody. I think the average player in Fortnite, um, this is old stats, but I remember I looked it up, it was something like between 50 to $80 per annum, right? On a free game. And it's like, Fortnite, I, I feel like, taught us, hey, forget about models, forget about all this stuff, just, you know, make a good game, right? And if people like your game, then people will, will pay you money, right? You know, I think that's just kind of the... Um, so, so, I mean, Benos, if you want to respond to that, feel free, but of course, we will go to name AMA with you, but I know Matthew, it sounds like, has some strong reactions, so we can go to him as well if you... Uh, yeah, Matthew, go for it. What are your thoughts? And then we'll go to David as well. So, yeah, I would say the funny thing about Fortnite is if you look at it, it's... It's definitely not a product that was just randomly build a good game. They, they use the billion dollars or more that has been sunk into game analytics to make sure that we can get people who play for free to pay for stuff. I mean, if you look at the games industry as a whole, every time we are more generous, we make more money and we bring in more people. You take the arcades. If you were to tell someone when uh, the arcades were at their, at their peak, actually, let's get a bunch of games put it on one console, put it in the home, and uh, let them play it basically for free. Um, just buy the games and you can play forever. They would have slapped you or window seated you, um, but that was the console, and that was actually a, a huge revolution. In Instead of paying every, every time you get beaten, you just buy it and you can play as many times as you like. Then we have Steam, where basically the games cost nothing. We had mobile. As soon as Apple and Google allowed us to put apps up for free, we the default price of an app was zero. So we had to find ways of making money out of it. And oh, by hell, we did. We made more money than you would ever believe. It's an $80 billion industry, um, primarily led by Asia in the RPG sector. So I think the thing is, the one thing we're really missing is we're missing game design on the collectibles. Uh, ben has brought up a really good point about not putting everything on chain. There's a reason for that. You don't want to have things that required to be owned by every single player to be on chain because that means that if there's a incentive to mint something or craft something like a monetary incentive you'll get infinite amounts of it because people will do that until the price goes down to zero limited nfts are definitely the way to go and i do believe we are missing a few easy quick wins in game design that will make this whole thing pop so so definitely agree that yes the <laughs> mechanics of fortnite are such that they are getting you to buy stuff, right? I'll get another free game that I think is a good game is StarCraft 2, right? Uh, RTSs, real-time strategies, age like fine wine, as they say, but you know what? They're not monetizing at all, right? Because of the systems in place. So just because you build a good game doesn't necessarily mean you monetize, right? StarCraft 2, great example, now a free game. But the thing is, you still have to build a good game if you want to have an opportunity to monetize and monetize in a sustainable way, right? So Fortnite, interestingly, was not popular in the beginning, right? It's Paragon, Epic had thrown billions of dollars, well, hundreds of millions, I don't think they threw billions, but millions of dollars into Paragon, it failed. And then there was this, like Fortnite Save the World thing, and then Fortnite Epic Games decided last minute to copy PUBG, right? Player Unknown Battlegrounds, like a South Korean company, and just copy the game design entirely and add building, right? So it's, um, you know, it just was kind of like an accident of history, but obviously it ended up being... A, a, a good one for them but at the end of the day it is you know it has become a good game even if it wasn't so in the beginning it was certainly unrefined but i guess that that's kind of the thing you, you got to have that and just because you have a good game maybe you don't monetize right maybe that's the thing Benas is talking about you got to have obviously methods and hooks to do so as a game and you got to survive right um you got to be able to eat but i guess that's kind of like table stakes right 
So David, 10x would, would be happy to hear from you. Um, thoughts on what Matthew, Ben Austin, some others have said. Oh man, honestly, we, we just we just covered like nine different topics in the past 20 minutes. So let me gather my thoughts really quick. First, I'm going to say something that a lot of people might not want to hear, but I don't know, like I don't think we're going to get that huge breakout game, Fortnite caliber, this cycle. I think it's going to come the next bull cycle. But what we do have is there are models that you can put into the big Web 2 games and they'll make money. They'll either make money or they will save money. You put crypto in any of these games, instant payments, settlement all around the world, Apple would, Apple would want that, Google would want that. And honestly, that, that's something that I like about BR1. Like, the model that they have, that makes the big gaming companies money. You throw that in Fortnite, they're not going to complain if they got an extra nine figures coming in. But, you know, we're... What uh, on to on to everything else? That that is one thing that I wanted to say. Something else that I love about Web three is there are tons of conspiracy theories around the whole Axie blow up. You take uh you know you got Yap, Gabby, and Jiho, and I don't really want to get into it. Three way love triangle over there worked out for some, didn't work out for others, and you know that is actually Wait, what? something Wait, that what uh, this, I've not heard. Of, okay, what uh, that's three hey, way look, okay, look 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 look. If if you know you know. I'm Make sure Mario up. knows, but, you know, like, I actually got into this industry because it actually had a guild way back in the day, did some stuff, and the new dawn, new day. Don't want to get into it. Let's do another space about it. Probably, like, five million listeners will come to that one. But, yeah. uh, oh, yeah, man, lo completely lost my, but, all right, yeah, found Well, it. you know, David, to, 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 to kind of hone in on, um, I always love the energy you bring, I'd say that to hone in on something, it may not be true that we ever in Web3 gaming get to the equivalence of what, you know, what, what is popular today, right? I mean, just look at VR, right? VR is a different category. And who knew that, like, hitting, you know, blocks with, you know, lightsabers would be, the, like, the most popular thing to do. Beat Saber, by the way, made by four people in Czech Republic. Like, no one would have thought that it, before. You just, like, VR, we're thinking immersive world, whatever. It turns out it's just, like, people want sticks that they want to hit boxes with, right? And have those boxes explode when you hit them. So... It's just the thing is, I think there's a possibility Web3, I'm not even saying this is true, this is just my conjecture, Web3 gaming is such a different thing, motivated by such different uh, structures as well as different architectures, that maybe it's just an entirely different thing. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know if that uh, is true or not, but I guess time will tell. Um, so yeah, Ryan, uh, feel free to jump in. Oh, and then we'll go to Benos afterwards. But yeah, Ryan, what do you think? One, I, I appreciate the kind words, David, and I agree that maybe it is the model that exists that will be the big thing that brings in this, this next wave of users, the next couple million guys into Web3 gaming. But I, you know, I want to point out the main, the, these large studios and these public companies, the, the publishers themselves, they're so hesitant to, to, to even act on any of these models like provably fair assets or the vertical extraction shooter or the real money shooter. And that gives us all so many fantastic opportunities to compete in we, we have Krafton on our cap table. Krafton are the, the owners of PUBG. To be able to bring in publishers and then demonstrate that for there to be external validation towards these models is an indication in itself that we're almost there. And that's all I, I really wanted to share. Super interesting. Benas? Yeah, I very much agree with Ryan, what he said. Um, and uh, there's a lot of hesitance um, until the model is out, out there. Uh, but uh, I'm going to share um, another insight, what we are seeing uh, from the blog game side. That we, what you mentioned, Eugene, that maybe you know, like all of these web free games are totally new beasts um, uh, from the model perspective. And maybe... There's a lot of uh, uh, talk that all of these games, we don't really require a lot of players. Since every single player in the game is so vested, same as it's that 1% of the user base in your free-to-play game, uh, then they're playing you know, like that game and they're investing, they're you know, like participating in all different loops of the economy. And that's exactly the same angle, you know, like what we are trying, what 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 the insights are sharing uh, around the pre games because users are very much more engaged, um, and we think and perform totally two different things when we have resources on stake. Yeah, I think it's super interesting. Um, I I wonder. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to hear more of the data, and I actually look forward to diving into the AMA. But I, you know, I wonder if part of it. 
is because part of the value of, I mean, it's just like uh, Metcalf's law, right? The value of a network is proportional to an increase of a, a square, like an exponential increase from the number of people in the network. That's why telephones are valuable. That's why social networks like Facebook and X are valuable. So I guess part of it is maybe, you know, having all those free players who are playing, you know, like free, you know, people in the lobby, for example, to get 100 people in your battle royale or whatever it is your game is, um, you know, just creates so much more value exponentially. So, and so I wonder, does that lead, therefore lead to, even if you have exact same game designs, does it lead to different things if, you know, you care about, you know, e even the big games like Clash of Clans famously catered to the whales, right? Even though most of the people were not spending any money. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the things that come to mind and why I would wonder if there's going to be a different way in which we think about, um, you know, Web3 gaming and what it eventually becomes. And the other thing I'll add is, Part of the reason why, I mean, there's a regulatory reason, obviously, why some of the big companies, you know, even, even Steam as a platform, right, as, you know, since 2018, I remember they started putting language in their terms of service because we're developers on Steam as well. Steam was one of the places we put our put our games. Um, and that, uh, you know, just showed, it was like, okay, we're, you know, they're starting to clamp down on cryptocurrencies. And part of it has got to be regulatory, right? Not because maybe they inherently, Valve inherently dislikes or likes cryptocurrencies. Though, frankly, a lot of these companies, I don't think, I don't think like crypto. Um, so, David, what, what do you think about all of this? No, I, I think that's a great point. And something about the majority of big companies that raise VC funds, they don't have to be profitable to be worth billions of dollars. You can have this network and nothing coming in, but the network has the potential to be monetized. There are so many different options out there. And, you know, honestly, I think we may even see something like that trickle over to us and we'll get some some huge token market cap that nobody knows what the heck's going on. More buys than sells. Price go up. Everybody stays happy. Like the, there, there's going to be some similarities that we see moving forward. And I'm, I'm excited to see how it goes. Of course, shrapnel. Sorry, Matthew, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to um, cheekily say we are seeing that right now. There are mm. plenty of companies that are kind of zombies because they have taken the money when they're getting was good. They have not either, either not delivered products or they've delivered enough NFTs or collections to make a significant amount of money, um, which has allowed them to buy up all of the publicity oxygen on this space, uh, Twitter, which does then generate revenue enough to kind of keep them going without releasing a product. So there are a few zombies in the space. There are a few people um, that are creating things that are probably too big for them to do, even if they're good teams, even if they're fantastic projects. Um, and they, there are, I think, some of the largest companies in uh, Web3 maybe don't deserve the valuations. And I think the sad thing is if they fail, it's going to make it much harder for people trying new models. And I, one of the things I've learned over the last two years of founding my own company and taking VC money, it's actually way more profitable and easier to raise if you run in the same wrong direction with everyone else than if you try to go the right way and then watch everyone run away from you and then catch up with you, again, taking all the money on the way. So it's not really, in this space, it's not good to be right. It's good to have a lot of money. Money is the best moat. Um, and then followed by that is the attention economy. Especially when we see AI coming in, we are, we're going to be at the, we're at the cusp of devaluing the amount of difficulty and, and cost it takes to actually create games. So mm. attention economy is definitely the, the place to be. Yeah, you know, I'd say a few things about that um, is, yeah, I've taken VC money and it is, and I've been a VC as well. So I've been a venture capitalist as well as a private equity investor. And, and it's interesting because you kind of got to toe the line because for you to really make an outstanding like zero to one company, like the Peter Thiel zero to one, you got to, you know, have some, you got to have, you got to have a truth that you believe is true. And that does end up becoming true uh, that a lot of other people don't believe in. But to your point, Matthew, it becomes challenging when, you know, I mean, well, like many people, a lot of VCs can think in some similar ways and they run in similar circles. So there's often a consensus, right? So it just becomes difficult. And I'd say money definitely is important. I mean, the most, one of the most important things in companies is don't go broke. But at the same time, in the long run, moats are defined um, by a whole host of things, right? I mean, like things like network effects and other stuff. So I mean, that's a whole conversation we get into uh, that might be uh, a little elsewhere. But uh, yeah, statutory views, welcome. Well, uh, Matthew, if you want to respond to that, feel free. And then Yeah, I was just going to say... I was just going to say you're correct that those moats are defined elsewhere, but it's very easy to generate them in our space with money. 
um, and whether That's it's true. like the smoke and mirrors metrics. And um, to your point about like there is a consensus, I think if you are hitting the consensus, even if you, in your heart you know it's wrong, you tend to raise, say if you raise 5 million, for the consensus play that's wrong, or you raise one million for the contrarian play, the consensus play has that chance to catch up with your contrarian view if you even get a little bit of traction. So it's just uh, it's a difficulty. And uh, I don't blame VCs at all for it. Yeah, super, super interesting, and it makes makes a lot of sense. Um, so attributes, uh, w- welcome to the space. Uh, well, by the way, we're going to get to block games shortly, but... Uh, in the beginning, we were talking about runes and, and, and ordinals and, and Bitcoin, but maybe right now we're obviously deep in Web3 gaming. We've had a few spaces on, you know, Web3 gaming as it relates to even Bitcoin. Uh, but one of the questions I asked is, why is the mempool so clogged up right now? There's like, it's 100 stats per V-byte. I've noticed that since this morning. So I don't know if there's anything going on today, but obviously the happening is in nine days. But yeah, I mean, if you can tie it, we're, we're deep in the topic of Web3 gaming. So if you can tie that with Bitcoin and runes and stuff like that. That might be the right uh, sequitur here. So yeah, I mean, uh, there's, there's many things I could say about Bitcoin runes and gaming. Um, I personally have always looked at ordinal theory as a way of, of ordinals really as a way of having indestructible Game Boy cartridges sort of put on chain in a way that people can enjoy them for for the rest of the time. So I think we're yet to see gaming get adopted onto Bitcoin in that capacity in a really sort of any sort of adopted way. But um, why is the mempool so high today? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I think everyone's realizing that they're probably going to be screwed in about a week's time. Um, and we're going to be seeing crazy fees for, for maybe a month or so. And so you have a lot of projects, right. a lot of artists are now just swooping ahead, trying to get anything inscribed before before those next eight days start getting a little hairy. Um, so yeah. it's going to be interesting to see if this weekend, historically, you know, normally mempool gets quiet over the course of Friday, Saturday night, EST. So we'll see um, We'll see if that happens this, this weekend. But uh, I anticipate yeah. for the first time we probably won't. Uh, I think it may just keep writing. So we'll see. Yeah, lots, lots of fun yeah. out there for sure. You know, one thing we had somebody in the last space. We were talking about a little bit more about Bitcoin and gaming. I'm not sure. Bitcoin, look, I'm a big fan of Bitcoin, as as I'm sure you know. But I'm not sure Bitcoin is the chain. You know, to have on chain gaming, right? I mean, I've seen a few on chain games. It's cool. There's, I've seen there's Doom, which is a sub one k inscription. You know, it's there, and you can play Doom, a, a pretty not great version of it. <laughs> But, um, you know, I, I'm just not sure Bitcoin is it, right? Because, I mean, even Solana is having, you know, issues with network congestion and stuff like that. I mean, Bitcoin, man, dude. I mean, everything on chain, a few hundred kilobytes, you using recursive inscriptions. But, I mean, how do you get... It depends, get it depends on what you... Well, it depends on how you look at it. Because the way I like, like to look at ordinals is like a big shared seed drive. And with more libraries, with more assets, with more everything, the content that can be created gets significantly more, more complex. And so, to me, this is really, really interesting because it forces game design into an entirely, I don't want to say a new way, back to the golden era where the space is finite and, and unupgradable back before you had internet connections to update games. You know, when you had a Game Boy game, it had to be perfect because if it wasn't, that thing was going to be set in a cartridge for the rest of the time, very much how it is. And so, to me, that is interesting. And I think that's going to peak the curiosity of a lot of game developers who will see that as a challenge of how can I use pre existing tools that may have already been inscribed. And how can I build something unique and, you know, a, a piece of art, a piece of interactive art, for lack of a better word. And so, to me, that's um, it's a different way of looking at gaming. Yeah, you couldn't do it for traditional sort of COD-type stuff, no, but there are definitely games out there, you know, dungeon crawlers, and like, like Zelda, you know, I've said it before, it's less than, less than 200 kilobytes, The Legend of Zelda, it's a phenomenal game. And didn't yeah. need much, you could fit that all on a single set now, and that could be on chain forever for anyone to play for free, and that's... That's a cool, powerful thing, I think, for any game developer to be to be drawn to. So, yeah, I mean, sure. in that regard, I think it's cool. So that's it's just how you look at gaming on Bitcoin. But I agree, you're not going to get COD or Fortnite on it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, I'll say maybe it's... Uh, well, first off, I've always said Chess and Go are some of the best games ever because they had thousands of years of refinement of their game design. And, uh, you know, those are pretty simple to implement. And maybe Bitcoin itself, Satoshi's Bitcoin, that he, you know, released... Uh, you know, um, you know, to, to, in, in defiance of uh, of fiat and centralized money, is the best game. The, the will come down in history as one of the best games of all time. We'll see. I don't know. Uh, not financial advice, but it'll be interesting. Interesting concept. Eric, uh, welcome to the space. Uh, Want to get your thoughts? And we will be moving over to the AMA with uh, Block Games very soon. But yeah, Eric, go for it. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. So uh, first off, if you can't play Doom on it, is it even really worth it? I think that's the uh... The first thing we need to discuss. Um, Does it play Doom? But, uh, and more right. Does it play Doom? I mean, if you can't do that, then, you know, 
but I, I thought I'd share like maybe a little bit of alpha or sort of inside vision here. So I'm the VP uh, of ecosystem over at Oasis. And if you guys don't know us, we're, uh, you know, uh, L1 gaming blockchain. And uh, we have relationships with Sega, Ubisoft, Bandai Namco, um, others. I can't even remember now. So we work with a lot of AAAs. And I thought I'd just share sort of for a few seconds, maybe, uh, you know, what I perceive as their opinions around Web3 gaming because we work with them in that space specifically. And, you know, each of them really has a very unique view on where Web3 gaming is going to go and how they're going to manage that. I think uh, Ubisoft is one of the bigger players in the space, and they've been fairly active and vocal about it. They have a game coming out with us in the next couple of months. Um, but, you know, like, so Ubisoft is a bunch of different independent sort of studios and organizations within one uh, ecosystem. So the specific studio that works on Web3 Gaming really does, like, experimental stuff, you know. And so they're really out there trying to push that and understand what works and put their sort of toe in the water. Versus if we look at Sega, we have a Sega game coming out uh, a couple of months after that. What they did is they partnered up with a very Web3 native company called uh, Double Jump Tokyo, which actually released their first game in 2017 on Ethereum. So they've been in the space for a while. And so for them, it's about working together with partners who really understand that space. And so each of these very large companies have like different hurdles that they have to get over in order to make that happen. So say, for example, Square Enix, they have a very large internal process and it takes time for things to happen versus where Ubisoft can push stuff, you know, faster. So it's very hard to lump these companies together. Each of them really have to go through their own sort of corporate structures and processes and hurdles to get to where they want to be. Versus we can talk about other companies like I would say like Blizzard Activision. They're just like, no, no Web3. We're not we're not doing that. It's not where we want to be. And honestly, if you look at the companies that really got into mobile early, you can see the companies that are willing to take risks and change. And I say, like, go play your favorite Blizzard game on mobile. And you're, it's, <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of choices. So yeah, the League of Legends is great, right? Done. So, I mean, you know, League of Legends, the mobile version is fantastic, for example. Yeah, so look look to see what they've done in other spaces, right? And how early they got in or how long they waited for that system to be proven out. And I think you'll figure uh, for similar parallels here in Web3. So I thought I'd just drop in and drop that alpha. So there are AAAs out there figuring out that process for them. You know, they're working on smaller titles first and um, not, you know, trying to take too much of a risk until they have an understanding of how that works. Yeah, super interesting. Um, yeah, any other folks want to jump in on what Eric said? If not, we'll move on to uh, Block Games and the AMA. All right, no takers. Cool. Well, uh, I guess Banas and the Block Games team, welcome. Uh, we've already been uh, lucky to receive some of your insights and thoughts, but want to hand the mic over to you all and, uh, yeah, tell us who, what Block Games is. And, um, yeah, happy to uh, start the AMA. And for the folks who from the audience who have questions, feel free to leave a comment uh, in the purple button on the lower right. And if speakers want to ask questions for the team, obviously feel free to raise your hand or jump in. So yeah, Benas and the Block Games team, the mic is yours. Yo, yo, cool, thanks. Yeah, so I think um, uh, not the first time uh, that I'm introducing Block Games. Um, and uh, today's topic, crypto gaming, you know, I very much relates to because there are a lot of web free games uh, under development, but they all lack players. And uh, the players question is the, big, the biggest one because not a lot of like a lot of games don't have ways to acquire players the pool of web gamers is pretty small the big question is how are we going to onboard mainstream traditional gamers um, and um, that question needs to be answered so the whole idea behind blog games is that we are building a player network uh, that helps mobile games uh, achieve growth through by, by using and utilizing any of our tools that are available and are connected to our infrastructure. Um, so think blog games as a community of players that each player within our ecosystem has an on-chain gaming identity that they control, they play with it, they accumulate rewards, they accumulate engagement data points, uh, and over time that data builds up. Uh, but also over time, whenever those players end up playing any of our connected games or participating in in any of our tools connected to the ecosystem, uh, they are receiving rewards in exchange for it. Um, and um, I think the whole idea really came back uh, more than two years ago when, uh, so I have a background about us. Uh, we are mobile game devs and we've been in the mobile gaming space for the last 10 years 
creating a bunch of mobile games, uh, publishing them out into the market. And uh, as you know, um, the, big, uh, the, the, the big tech uh, has really put uh, um, a big stop on, uh, on, on how user acquisition takes place. So last few years for mobile gaming space has been extremely bleeding because um, users have an optional opt-in for data sharing and that is basically affecting a lot of parties involved. So basically advertisers, they don't get information who is who. Uh, game developers, we don't know who is coming into their game, so we have less information um, to to, 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 to grow that game, uh, ad networks that support uh, um, user acquisition um, and, and so forth and forth. So a lot of gaming publishers actually over the last few years have been scaling primarily through acquisitions of um, other studios that already had players. Because right now that model of acquiring players into the into into into, into your game um, is not uh, sustainable, and only few games are making it through, which have a very um, good 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 model to support it, uh, and are able to monetize the user bases. And overall, the insight is that mobile ga like mobile game publishing is shifting, um, uh, not not only from the model how mobile games are being uh, monetized, but also to the model that uh, to, to to the model how you are growing your game. Uh, there are a lot of influencer talks, there are a lot of angles, how you how can you employ your community so they could help your game grow without you spending you know like any dollar on marketing and etc etc and there are a lot of interesting concepts uh, and, uh, and and products that can be built around that and blog games is that so we are the home for mobile game publishing for both traditional games and web free games and we have a bunch of tools rolling out right now our first tool that has been rolled out uh, more than a few months ago uh, called reward to play uh, allows us to match players with games um, and we've scaled that we scaled that uh, uh, application to over a million users, uh, and we have over a million users within a, a, our community uh, of the player network, where each player is aggregating their own chain gaming identity, and we are working with 200 plus mobile games across 50 leading mobile game publishers from Scape, uh, from uh, Scopely, Playtica, and others. And uh, right now, uh, released actually today the token, the block token that supports the entire ecosystem. And uh, we've just been focused on the growth for the first product, and we have uh, additional products going live into the market throughout this year, plus uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch of focus on the mobile game devs uh, as we are. Uh, uh, building up partnerships with traditional game 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 ga games as well as uh, web free mobile games. Yeah, very interesting. Can you talk a little bit more about the universal player profile? Like, how does it work, and then you know what kind of rewards? I guess how is it different, right? I mean, you, you kind of teed it up a little bit, but I just maybe dive a little more about this specific concept. Yeah, of course. So think of it as your um, your your basically uh, on chain uh, ID, um, and uh, anything that goes into that profile um, is basically your uh, engagement across any of the games or applications connected by the blog games infrastructure. Although you are the sole owner of that on-chain gaming identity, you hold the key to all of the data, and by visiting any of the games or applications connected to it, you are able to share that data for which you are redeeming rewards. So that gaming identity is across all of the chains, um, and we are getting both on-chain data streams as well as um, off-chain engagement data from any of the games that we partner with. And basically, it's accumulating data um, uh, back into your profile. But nobody else is able to see that data until you visit that particular game or application and uh, and, uh, and then you have uh, your uh, universal player profile uh, linked up and connected. Um, I think the whole uh, example here is that we, we are calling it rewarded data uh, ownership because every single time while you play games, um, traditional mobile games uh, are profiting of you. What's happening here is that you are receiving um, a share of whatever the games are using uh, with your data while you're playing that game. So they might be, you know, like showing you ads. They might be offering you better purchases, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And through this system, you are receiving um, a partial reward uh, on the back of it for sharing that data in the first place. But that, but the more interesting part is that once this grows and we unlock the network effects, it actually powers a lot of 
new generation mobile game publishing tools. Um, so uh, it opens up uh, a, 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 a grounds of opportunities where mobile game publishers can connect with mobile gamers in a totally different way. So by offering, for example, airdrops, uh, um, by, offering, uh, by, by, by offering rewards, to the players you want to offer the rewards to by offering real by, by, by offering rewards to the real users since you want to know who the real user is in your game uh, and uh, this whole uh, problem around bot uh, prevention is just growing um, you're able to engage with, you, with your users uh, you're able to uh, provide uh, Esports identities and reputation, as well as you're able to uh, provide uh, as, uh, pro provide basically feedback and uh, testing uh, uh, rewards for engaging with the entire user base. So basically, think of it as a best match for your game. If you have a game or RPG, like in the blog games player network, you know that there's like 30% of RPG players that you want to connect with, and so on, so on. So one, one question I have related to all this is, um, what is the reason, so it, when we talked about earlier about how different Web3 gaming might be, maybe it's maybe it'll be the exact same and it'll just be a continuation, I imagine so, the answer is probably somewhere in between, um, an evolution, so to speak, but we're, you, even you were mentioning something about the successful Web3 gaming companies have, you know, high, you know, let's say, I mean, wh whatever the CAC is, the customer acquisition cost, the, you know, sort of the lifetime value LTV of a user can be higher. Right. And we're seeing we've seen that in, you know, existing web three games now might not be true in the future. But in that case, I mean, ad networks rely on math, right? Just like a lot of players. Right. And that's probably why part of the economics of the free to play games is you just get a lot of players who play for free and a few pay for money. But if, if web three games are more focused on the few people who make money, like then won't the ad networks and the idea of data around ad networks be less relevant in a, in a future? Um, or, you know, am I missing something there? Yeah. So data is relevant for any any any, any tool out there, right? Uh, so both, networks, both, you know, like um, specific engagement tools, feedback and uh, testing tooling, uh, bot prevention systems, user acquisition. You want to know who the user is, and you want to be able to offer a specific reward for that group of users. For example, you know, like that we would be able to distribute. I don't know a specific custom reward to everybody who's participating in this space but i want to be distributing only to the users that i know that they might be interested in playing my game and you know like it goes on and, and and on so um think of it as a base layer uh, we don't want to be seen uh but uh, we, want to, we want to be but 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 users will be aware of us uh while uh, a lot of tools uh, and applications will be built uh, on top of this infrastructure yeah super super interesting um so I guess, what is the traction to date, you know, uh, what is, yeah, just tell us about what uh, the latest things that are happening uh, for you are. Sure, so so we launched um, the first product called Rewarded Play. So through that product, we've onboarded over a million users. We currently have 300 games available uh, across all of those, across, uh, across that application. Our players are engaging, are driving a lot of engagement data across all of those games, um, and we are seeing uh, around a couple of million points every single day uh, on on different engagement points. So basically, they make an action in one game, um, or um, we are making actions across multiple games, or we are connecting their wallets, and we are seeing what games we are playing on chain. So all of that right now is tying up into basically a network of players and a network of data um, that applications and games can connect to it. Um, and uh, right now, over the next uh, quarter, we're focusing primarily on web free games. Um, so we're launching uh, a campaign uh, to support uh, uh, all of the web free tier one games uh, in, 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 on the mobile platforms. Um, so that's, that's the big uh, milestone that is coming up on our side while we're also launching the infrastructure so we could support more applications like rewarded play to be built on top um, so we are uh, we're growing we have a live product uh, we've just launched a token to support that infrastructure that uh, is rolling out over the next months um, and uh, and also we have additional uh, we have additional products and their development so focusing around user acquisition and engagement for now so we just want to help mobile games out there grow we have a bunch of games coming up with the up, up over the next two years I think I've heard from Ryan, 2025 is the year, um, and there's going to be a lot of games 
that will need a lot of players. And we want to be there as their main um, uh, access for mobile game publishing. Yeah, awesome. Sounds good. Um, by the way, uh, I just got tagged. So, so just to make sure that we're talking about so uh, in these spaces, we, we like to think about ourselves as being non-biased and just asking questions. But I did get, just get tagged in this, which was worst player, dollar M-O-N, is saying, EYC, I thought this was supposed to be an AMA for the community. And it feels you know somewhat scripted. That's the comment. So by the way, guys, there's 457 comments and counting. Feel free to tag me in any questions you want to ask. But if you have an interesting question, I'm happy to bring you up because uh, this is my first time meeting Ben Austin Block Games. And by the way, I've, I've said this before in other spaces, but most of the time, it's no one asks the sponsor questions during the AMA. So I would love it if other people requested and had the questions asked or feel free to tag me. But I can't read through all 460 comments now to know what questions to ask. So yeah, I, I don't have any context other than, um, you know, the context that's being provided here. But I always really, really enjoy when other people ask our sponsors questions. That is always true. So it looks like Matthew has something you want to add. Feel free to jump in. Yeah, what questions do you have for, um, for Ben Austin and the team? Hey, so um, it was more through uh, kind of comments that were arising and, you know, I kind of tune out most of the dollar sign, like token name farming. So I kind of didn't even associate you with the amount of, um, of stuff that I've been seeing on my feed for the block farming. I, I wonder since there's, um, there's an opportunity without maybe bringing individuals up from the community who feel like something has went wrong. I wonder if you are aware that there seems to have been some kind of issues with people claiming during this process, or uh, maybe if there's anything you could say to the community around the process or, or something like that for the whole um, farming side of it. I mean, I don't know much on this myself. I, I never farm tokens because I figure that's going to come back to bite me as a, as a founder at some point. Um, but just wanted to let you know that there seems to have been a few things in the community with potentially some influences as well. So, Yeah, so you're yeah, very, very much aware of it. And uh, we uh, launched the token today. Uh, for everybody's notice, um, the block token. And uh, as mentioned over the space, over the last uh, few months, we grew exponentially to over a million users in our ecosystem, actually, to be precise, 1.4. Um, and uh, a lot of that came also um, from uh, a lot of interested uh, users uh, who joined the farming uh, campaign to help uh, spread the word about block. And uh, I mean, for the allocation of the tokens, we had uh, allocated uh, 3% of the total airdrop for all of the users. And we had 1 million users participating in the airdrop. Um, so I think naturally uh, the expectations, you know, like were mismatched as a lot of users were uh, expecting large allocations though with the large interest and everybody participating in the airdrop. We just uh, uh, had to spread uh, across all of the users uh, the airdrop allocations um, that those were both participating uh, and uh, competing against uh, uh, each other. So I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, like, um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, like hype uh, and excitement uh, and uh, maybe uh, bearishness uh, at every single launch because uh, there's uh, a lot of rewards being distributed. Sometimes not everybody uh, gets in the rewards. Uh, and I think we are aware very much uh, as a team and uh, uh, as a project uh, overall, the entire, you know, like name shouts for player network. So we are for the community and the entire uh, tokenomics are designed for the community to be distributed as rewards. So we will do everything in our, uh, in our, in our actions to ensure that, to, to ensure that the community is rewarded. Okay. So just to respond quickly to that. So am I right in understanding that you were kind of a victim of your own success? and that you'd already fixed the allocation with your launch partners and therefore the allocation for the um for the airdrop to the to the farmers seemed less individually um because you were were more successful is are you tempted or are you thinking to potentially increase that allocation or is there something else you're going to do for these people Web. So, so yeah. So uh, I think you know, like the anticipated, uh, you know, like the anticipated interest from a lot of community members who were participating in the airdrop campaign. We all wanted to participate in it, and we wanted to make sure that we were rewarding most of the users. Um, and uh, of course, you know, like we were processing uh, undecidable. Uh, uh, and the cyber process is to ensure that uh, suspicious activity you know, would be limited, uh, but nevertheless, our 
interest was to reward as many users as possible. And I think with the whole you know like narrative that uh, some of the users are unhappy, we have to we are we, we will be taking actions over the next uh, months to start rewarding more of the users, as especially as the ecosystem grows. I mean, we just launched the ecosystem a few months. We are only at one million users while the entire mobile gaming space is 3 billion players. So we're just getting started. We will be in a couple of months, but there's a couple of million extra users, and uh, we will uh, bring all of the incentive programs that we've planned over the next few months as we scale the ecosystem. So, yeah, I think long answer short, um, the Blog Games Player Network is for the users, and uh, we want to be the users' network community. So we'll do everything in our way to fix that and to reward the users because without the users we are nothing yeah yeah sounds good uh, by the way I, I i for the record didn't know about any of any of this drama but uh it is interesting i'm glad you're addressing it uh directly benas uh just because uh i think it's important to like anything just address things directly um we are very very close to out of time but i did bring om gina up because uh i mean there's a lot of comments like hers but sounded like you wanted to opine uh so you know we just keep in mind we're actually over time now but want to give people an opportunity to say things so yeah om gina go for it Floor is yours. Yeah, I'd like to um, talk on the point of being transparent and talking about things. We had a space earlier with 8,000 people. We've been for months um, grinding for this project, and he was asked if he could open a space because people were very upset, um, and, and they failed to. And then now we see him on Mario's space like, oh, you know, we're doing gaming. Like, give us a break. Um, do what's right. Um, hold accountability. And I also am very curious about the why the team dumped and people weren't allowed to claim 15 minutes before i'm sorry the team dumped and people had to wait 15 minutes to claim prior it seems i don't know if that's sure but i wanted to ask about that yeah so i think on the space uh, we've been focusing on putting this space as the main space of today uh, for announcing all of the information to the entire community and on the claiming everything has been unlocked for all investors, pre-sale and uh, community at the same time of the TG. So I think any 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 misunderstandings can be addressed uh, uh, and uh, we are addressing as we speak uh, for our communication for our communications uh, on Discord and uh, Twitters and um, and I understand a lot of community members being uh, unhappy with uh, the the allocations. Um, so I said um, earlier. Yeah, they spent a lot of money. Right. They spent a lot of money into this project. I mean, not only upset, people are actually in debt from supporting you guys. Um, so I hope that you listen to the space that I pin in there and take notes and try to make it right because you guys are known as the project of the biggest scam of the year. That's pretty bad. Yeah, unfortunately here I'll listen into the space and I'll address every single question. I appreciate that. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks. I mean, you know, for those who say our AMAs are scripted, definitely not. Uh, but you know, the problem is, of course, all the all the comments and questions. It's hard to do it do it in real time. But I'm glad we have people like Gina and others and and Matthew asking you know direct questions uh, because you know you guys are more informed uh, than I am. But Benas, uh, I appreciate that you are uh, just being very direct with folks. But uh, any other things you want to leave for, you know, the thousands of people we have gathered here. Um, yeah, what kind of what kinds of things or any other things that we haven't uh, touched on yet? Uh, I'd be happy to give you the mic. Sure. So I think um, I really appreciate, you know, like the time um, here on the space and I also appreciate um, the, uh, the opportunity to uh, connect with the community and to answer some of the questions. Um, I think where uh, the entire mobile gaming space and overall web free gaming space is, grow is going is that inevitably we're going to have uh, uh, an, a, a large acceptance across the industry and a, lo a lot of players will be coming in across any of the games that are currently being under development. So we will be seeing a lot of adoption happening over the next few years and all of that adoption will need um, a lot of uh, help on publishing uh, and uh, matching all of those incoming games with the players. Um, and also, you know, like on the note on the launches, uh, I think uh, today's launch you know, like might have um, 
might, might, might have upset a uh, few, few, few people and we'll make it all right in every way possible to make sure that uh, Blog Games uh, is the leading model game publishing over the years to be because we are building for long term and uh, we've always said that from the beginning. So uh, with that said, again, I appreciate uh, a lot uh, for your time and uh, um, hopefully we will see in one of the uh, games uh, upcoming, uh, upcoming fortnights uh, next year. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I again, I, I know very little about your the specific drama, um, but you know, I think part of the definition, as somebody who's invested in a lot of companies, used to be VC and a PE and private equity as well. I think it's you know every company faces problems, right? Um, and not knowing about the specifics of any one problem, but it's about how the companies handle the problems uh, that I think define uh, that company's either successes or failures over the years. So yeah, we'll we'll keep an eye on you and. Uh, you know, we, we look forward to seeing, um, you know, how you, you know, overcome these problems, but also future ones. Uh, and thanks, actually, for the whole community for for kind of alerting us. And, you know, we, we aim to be very genuine and authentic in our questions and whatnot. Uh, and uh, hopefully today we, we try to give at least a little bit because I literally just went through the comments and just brought up people like Gina, who actually had just very direct comments. Um, so, yeah. And, and sorry if I missed the, some of the rest of you, but there are just so many comments. It's hard to see them all. Um, I get tagged in a lot, and these and my DMs are so full. But yeah, thank you uh, guys for participating in a frank discussion. And yeah, GameFi, Web3, crypto gaming. Uh, excited to see you all in the next one, and excited to, um, yeah, I want to thank all the speakers and all the audience members for being gathered here today. Thanks, everybody. Take care. See y'all.